you know, I had a feeling this stock was going to do this today. I don't know why, but it had such a strong pre-market and, you know, it was up 150 and then it had a huge sell off at the open and it's been consolidating ever since. And I just was like, this could be one of those midday, yeah. midday runners. That like um, curl under view up. So it like curls yeah. and then it gets back above, reclaims it, pulls back, uses view up as support instead of resistance and then rips up through there. And it only right here, uh, let me share my screen, I guess just in case. Um, it only breaks VWAP slightly here, but on tiny volume, which is always, not always, but I would say like 70 to 80% of the time, yeah. the big confirmation that, uh, you know, it's still a bullish move because. It's only worth it if you work for it. It's only worth it if you work for it. I won't stop till they hear me now. I won't stop till I wear the crown. A Man, low break. Nice profits. This is my, my, yeah, today was great. Um, it, you know, it could have been better, could always be better. But my problem today was like AUD. It was a sub dollar. Instantly, I was down like 400 on it. Then I had a small mm. green trade on it. And then I was actually down on these two tickers as well. So I was down like five something. And I was like, man, nothing is working out for me. And then BDTX popped up pre-market and I was like, it was in this area and I was trading it with tiny size. Cause I was just like, oh, it's probably going to be another ticker that doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. And it just keeps ripping. And then all of a sudden it has like almost a million shares mm -hmm. uh, per minute pre-market, which is, it doesn't, that that's rare. That, that only happens. It almost never happens. There was like, I think two weeks or last week, we actually had that happen. Um, and I was already like, what? I have barely ever seen this. So I knew this ticker was like in, in play. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started getting really aggressive on it here and then here. And then, I don't know, in the consolidation phase, I didn't want to trade it because I figured I'd give back money. And then I actually traded a little bit of the backside, which I usually never do. But this ticker had beautiful support zones where even the backside bounces were like six, 8%. Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of like scalping the heck out of it. And then at this point I was like, maybe I should keep trading because I feel like there's going to be, you know, big opportunities on this one. But I also felt like there was a ton of things in my head that I wanted to get done. And yeah, I don't know. Then I did like a few more trades here and I started thinking about my P and L because I was over yeah. you know, 1200. And then I was like, okay, my mind's I'm distracted. I'm officially distracted. Yep. Yep. And that's, that's always a good time to call it, at least for me personally. Yeah. You can kind of just notice whenever you're like, you lost the flow. Yeah, it's for sure. Like, like I had separates. To, exactly. I had to make it where I didn't have to, but I, I was trying to finish up my YouTube video that I was working on. And, um, yesterday I had to do some coding and that's why I stopped trading because my brain was already over there and I was up, you know, on a Monday and mm -hmm. um, so I was like, yeah, let me call it. And for you, it's like probably, you know, if, if your mind starts wandering to like your your Airbnb thing, you're probably thinking yeah. like, uh-oh. Yeah. So we, it sucks because like, I wish that the the spy just gave like 20 opportunities a day because then I'd walk away and be like, all right, it's fine. But it only is giving like one to two max a day and they're super hard to catch. So it's like, I can't sit here and be focused for four hours straight waiting for literally the one entry I get, you know? Yeah. It's, it's so tough, but I'm trying to figure, I'm trying to like, think more of like, like it's a, like before I used to think, Oh, I should only take like two trades a day, but now I'm more in the boat of like, I can take starters. I can add it to my winners. I can just let things go a little more because I've been sizing up. So like one contract now doesn't feel like anything to me. So I'll like just put in a starter position and then see if it goes up five or six points and try to add into it. But yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really hard. Yeah. Adding, adding into winners, I find so difficult right yeah. now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then the thing that makes it even more tricky is the fact that the S and P 500 is extended as hell. And the only reason it's extended is because of uh, Tesla, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Google, Netflix. That's literally it. And then um, every day you'll see the advanced decline line, which tells you like all the top, the 2000 stocks in New York Stock Exchange. And it'll tell you like what's going up and what's going down. 
And let me just show you actually. Yeah, you're probably much better at sharing this than I am. So this on the top, this is test. This is if you just push a plus sign, you can add a bunch of tickers up on TOS. So I added up like Amazon and Apple, Google, Netflix, Nvidia, Tesla, Microsoft, and you can see yesterday. This is a, this is actually really nice for people that trade the S and P five hundred because the weighted stocks have such a huge impact on the S and P five hundred. But at the same time, you want to look at these too, which is the overall stock. So the ADD down here, this is telling you how many stocks out of the 2000 ish New York stock exchange stocks are moving, uh, are green on the day compared to red. So you can see yesterday, you can see yesterday how the ADD right here rips off the open. Like this is a massive green move for the ADD, but then Tesla, Microsoft, Amazon, the weighted they move up a little bit, but then they just fade that the whole way back through low of day. And then the advanced yeah. decline line stays flat. So it's like extremely hard to trade the S&P 500 whenever that's happening, because it's basically saying these hedge funds are selling the weight of Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, whatever, and they're buying all the rest of the shit, the S&P 500. So it's either one or the other. Like whenever you actually want a trend to happen in the futures market, you have to have the weighted index moving the same direction as the advanced decline line. So like if Tesla, Apple, Amazon, whatever, are all moving down and the advanced decline line is moving down, the S&P 500 is going to move down. But recently they've been just inversing each other every day. So advanced decline lines up, Tesla and all them are down. So the market just kind of has no follow through and it doesn't actually go anywhere. It just like kind of chops in this tight little range for the whole day, or it just randomly drops at like 4 PM, you know, like yesterday, it just like dropped 20 points, 10 points in the last like 30 minutes out of nowhere. But yeah, the extendedness yeah. has made me nervous. So I was closing a lot of my swing trades, uh, I think last week. And I think I had no swing trades uh, going into this week. And then I started doing a little bit of bottom balancing, but I still think I've been actually closed my bottom balances uh, today. And I kind of think we're going to get another sell off below 430 on the SPY because it just kind of has like this insane front side. And now we had one of those really strong pullbacks. And sometimes mm -hmm. you get like this little dead cat bounce, you get that second pullback. And then you get that continuation. If we do get a continuation, I see that a lot with small caps and I don't, I don't want to compare small caps to the SPY so much, but what I do find at the end of the day is like price action is just, you know, human emotions on a chart. And I feel like you see a lot of the same things just playing out in different time frames. Yep. So I don't, I, I hate over managing my, my kind of swing trades, but I would rather, yeah, I think you told me this, uh, in a tweet like a couple months ago where it's like you want to put your limit orders where people are putting their stop orders yeah. <laughs> and uh right now it kind of feels like you know people are putting their their limit orders here and their stops are going to be if there's a flush or like a sell-off so i'm waiting for that bigger dip and if i'm wrong i miss it i don't even care you know yeah. i i like to have a bigger cash position right now yeah, uh, it just sure. feels better so yeah, that's that's my yeah. take. Plus, nah, nah, all good. <laughs> it's so hard to know. Uh, it's so hard to know what you should do in terms of like, like in your retirement account. Is it better to try to play the sentiment game in the S and P five hundred, where you're like, okay, everyone is super bearish right now. I should be going long. Everyone is super bullish right now. I should be shorting. Or is it better to just do dollar cost averaging forever? I mean, obviously it's going to be like a to each its own sort of thing, but like for me, I have like my IRA and all I'm doing is holding TLT. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing with my IRA. Like I'm not trying to actively trade it. That's why I just want to hold TLT. Cause I think at some point when rates start going down, uh, like actually fast TLT is going to go up a lot, but yeah. yeah. You want to share TLT? <laughs> I actually saw you talk about it. Um, I think you made a video about it, didn't you? Or no. Maybe we talked maybe we talked about it here and that's why it's so in my head. Yeah, I um, talk about it a lot to random people because I want them to follow me into this trade. So when I lose, I don't feel like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you heard it, guys. <laughs> yeah. So uh, maybe not follow me on this one because this is a uh, someone says treasury. I'm pretty much already blanked out and I'm like, huh? <laughs>
but um obviously the 20 year treasury should become more desirable as uh rates drop but the thing that sucks is they're so sensitive to rates so like you know if rates go if rates go up another you know 50 basis points in the next two meetings which they're predicted to do this could easily take out this low and then in that case i'll be down you know probably over five points five percent yeah that's a lot I was in it, dude. My entry on this was amazing. And I just never sold it. Like I bought this right here. I was averaging into it. I think I bought a little here, a little here, and then I bought more here. And then it went up and I was up like 10% with my legit full IRA. And then um came back down and I never I never sold it. Something that I like to tell myself sometimes is like, if I'm in, up 10% on like a, on a very slow moving index, I, I tell myself, Hey, this is, this is like people's goal for the whole year. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes you just take your profits and you wait for the inevitable pullback. And if you miss it, yeah, I don't, I don't know. So be it, uh, you can always buy on like a retest months later. Yeah. I feel like I've done that a few times and it's it's paid off quite a bit but I I don't know to you know I just zoomed out on the SPY cuz when you said like what would you know like what's the best thing to do in your IRA and you know I started playing around with uh interest rates and uh investing when I was pretty young like around 10 with my dad he would be like cool. you know like if you ever have, you know have your uh, you know, like 50 bucks from your chores and, you know, at the end of the month or something like leftover, give it to me and I'll give you like a 5% interest rate or whatever it was. I, I forgot. And that's when I, I was like, oh, this is like kind of cool. Like I can make money from money. And I, that always really interested me as a kid. And, you know, if I just you know, DCA, you know, dollar cost average since let's say 2000, um, I was eight years old around 2000. So where is it? Uh, that's around here. So, you know, I, for a long time, like, you know, this probably would have yeah. been a little discouraging 164 bars. It's like, this is a monthly. So what is that? Like mm -hmm. 10, 20, no, 10, 12 years. Yeah. I would have basically been flat uh, for DCA. So that would have been a little frustrating, but then, you know, really ripped up and I would have been up probably like over 200% because I would have made my base here. Yep. So I, I don't know, like DCA would have really worked well in the last, you know, 10 years. But I think if you're a full-time trader and you study the markets, I don't think that's the best strategy. And I think going, uh, you know, if there's blood in the streets, I think just buying. Uh, and if, you know, everyone's super crazy, then it might be best to you know, wrap up a little bit. It's, it's really tough for me to comment on this because one of the best strategies in the world that is proven over and over again is trend following, which is basically as simple as, you know, follow the trend. Uh, like, you know, once this is trending up and it doesn't break um, like the 15 EMA, you just keep riding it. So you'd get out here, then you'd get back in here and you keep riding it and you get out here. Um, so specifically with like big money. So my, my take is I kind of like the trend following in a way with, let's say, uh, small caps in a way we're trend following, but we're constantly actively managing it, right? So BDTX, for example, if I just use this one, uh, because it's such a crazy ticker today, uh, and it's super relevant. I'm hiding my trades right now. I'm on a different account, so you don't see it. But ultimately, what I was doing is, you know, I was accumulating on these pullbacks. You know, we're riding a trend. We're above the 90 EMA. And, you know, I'm just trying to, I don't know how far it's going to go. Maybe it's going to go to here and then die out. Maybe it's going to go to here and die out. I don't know. But all I'm doing is riding the trend. So for me, what I look at is those five-minute breakouts. And if there's a one-minute pullback and we're above the close of the former five minutes, that would be like, you know, if this is pulling back to here, but tech, we're still way above the former five minute. That's an entry point for me. Um, but when the five minute is starting to be below, that means the one minute pullbacks aren't really entries anymore because the, the trend is dying. So then I get like really scalpy, let's say. I, I won't look for a breakout if or the five minute is not over the former five minute. 
Um, I'd actually long call with Toby about this, explaining it. And this actually keeps me out of a lot of trouble because you typically don't buy moves anymore that are getting very weak. So there might be what you would describe, let's say the five minute is a macro and the one minute is a micro. So you don't wanna be buying a pullback if the macro trend is backside because it's just gonna con continue going backside or there's a lot less likelihood of a good breakout. Yep. And I just kind of apply that to small caps and large caps and it works pretty well. So for example, here, BDTX, look at this. Now it's kind of the opposite. So yep. the five minute is below the former five minute close. So technically any pullback to the upside would be a short opportunity. That's a good one minute entry because now we're just kind of flipped the conversation upside down. But here you wouldn't want to be buying this one minute pullback, even though it looks just as good as this one minute pullback or this one minute pullback to the untrade eye. Like look at this to the untrade eye. You're like, Hey, it's doing the nine email pullback again. But here the five minute is below the foreigner former five minute close. So we're on a macro backside. So that's why this five, this one minute micro pullback is not a good opportunity. And here you can just see how it sells off. And that's, that's kind of how I, you know, trade small caps. And ultimately it's a trend following strategy. The thing is I just don't hold and see how far it's going to go. Like I don't just buy here and let's see how far it goes, yeah. which, you know, sometimes you're like, man, I just, I wish I bought at 250 and I held till four. Right. But you know, 90% of the stocks just pop up and, and fade and you're going to, you're going to get death by a million cuts. So I would rather take my scalps and that's, that's works well for me. And that's how I'm up, you know, 1400 today. So, um, yeah, sorry about going on that tangent. These are a lot no, of my swing yeah, trades yeah. right now. But. Um, like, so obviously we, we talk about linear bet sizing and exponential bet sizing. And I was listening to a podcast yesterday and the guy said something in the realm of, um, any strategy can work, but the professional trader knows how to apply that strategy in ways that a non-professional wouldn't. So it's like any strategy is fine, right? Breakout strategy. Yes. Like breakouts work, breakdowns work. Yes, they do. But you have to be very specific on when you do it. When are they really good? When are you adding into your winner? When are you just scalping it? You know, and there's like yeah. those little nuances are what makes trading so difficult because yes, like the strategy you have could, could literally show itself every day and every day it could have a different expected value. Right. Yeah. So, you know, like the markets on a, the yearly chart on the SP 500, let's say it's on a front side, the 30 minutes on a front side, the two minute is on a front side. We're above yesterday's high, right? That's like the, like a five minute candle breakout, like you're talking about, but it's like on a larger scale. Cause it's SP 500. We're above yesterday's high. We're breaking out on all time frames. How likely is that going to be to continue? Well, pretty fucking likely because you're in an uptrend on the daily chart, the 30 minute chart, the two minute chart. What does that mean? It means when you break out, other people are going to be stopping out of shorts and hedge funds are going to be buying into it because they want to participate in the market. So it's like, that's whenever you need to know, okay, this is a situation that happens maybe 10 times a year total. And whenever this happens, I literally need to get all my chips and push them all in. Cause like, that's the only time where you can make up for all of the little shitty decisions you made on days that were where the yearly chart was in a backside and the 30 minute was on a front side and the two minute was on a backside and they're all contradicting each other. And there's not really confluence anywhere. And you're just trading this chop thinking, Oh, it's going to break down. It's going to break down. And it just goes like a barcode all day. And then you end up down $200, you know, that's exactly it. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. When you, when you see that breakout, you, ha you have to jump in it. And then that kind of, is the opposite of, you know, DCA sometimes in my mind where you're like, you're just yeah. trying to accumulate and then it's high and you're just like, oh, let me sell it. It's high because technically if it's high, that's when it in theory should keep going if it breaks out. And that's kind of where you make all your money. Mm -hmm. uh, the book went up on wall street. Um, he talks about that where he has like a hundred mediocre trades, you know, you lose, 
10%, you make 10, 20%, but then he has those 10 baggers, which he calls 10 baggers where it goes up 10 X or something like that. And that's where he, you know, he's holding his stock into these big front side moves and he just doesn't sell it. And that's kind of what it's about to make those big profits. So in our case, it would be, okay, there's that breakout. This this is when I you know, want to size up 5X, 7X, because that's where I, my expected value is super, super high. So today I should have, I was a little bit disappointed with myself actually, because I, like I showed you, I think uh, right in the beginning, I was read on all these different tickers. And I was down like five, $600. And I was like, you know, I was trending red. And when I'm trending red, I trade with smaller and smaller and smaller size because I have yet to prove that today I'm in any sort of flow. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you're really meshing with the markets. Today I wasn't at first. So I kept sizing down so I don't, you know, go down faster and faster. So then BDTX pops up and I start, uh, I start, you know, having like three green trades in a row on it. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like then I was getting close to back to break even. So then I only started sizing, you know, but some of the best moves were already behind us. But yeah. Um, yeah. For me, it's like, I, I also have to manage my P and L flow. So if, if I'm not in a flow, I can't size. And I think if I, if I could have started, avoided some stupid trades or like not even stupid trades, I just, you know, three tickers that all didn't work. That's how it goes sometimes. Uh, so, and I wasn't only down $500. That's actually pretty tiny for like taking like yeah. eight, nine trades I did. Uh, so yeah, by the time the good ticker popped up, if I was green already, I would have been able to do that four or five X size, but I wasn't allowed to, I wasn't allowing myself to do that yet because if this one didn't work out either, yeah. I would have had a 1K day, uh, red day really quick uh, if I sized. So sizing is so important. Yeah, it's like, how do you, like basically all we're saying is the professional trader has to make sure that whenever your scenario, your strategy is not good, you have to minimize your losses to the absolute smallest possible amount. And then whenever yeah. they're good, you have to maximize your wins. And that is such a weird, like that is the hardest part of trading, at least for me right now, because yeah, like I can go into my stats and say, oh, look, this strategy is a profitable strategy. But then in the same way, you know, like if I don't if I don't learn how to size properly in that strategy, it's not a profitable strategy because yeah. like a trend reversal, right? So if you look at, if, if anyone is listening and they have stats and they're looking at their stats and your win rate is negative, well, that means you have to get at least a 1.1 R to make money. Like you have to yeah. beat that. You That's like casinos, they win 51% of the time and they have a one R because they can have billions of dollars be coming in and out of there. That's not what we're doing in trading, at least if you're like have a low win rate. I mean, you could do like there's reversal trading and continuation trading. Continuation, you're going to have like an even win rate and your risk reward is going to be pretty much one to one. And those are strategies where you have to use big size, but it's really hard because you only really get one chance to get in, right? Because at least for me, like you can obviously be like a 30 minute continuation trader where you're going to hold for days, but that's not what I'm doing. I'm still getting in and out in one day. You're getting in and out in like five minutes. So how do you size into something um, if you only get one entry, right? Like, how do you know it's really good if you only get one entry? Because for me, like, let's say I'm doing a reversal or something of that nature. I'll get in, I'll be up like a good amount already, and then it will come back to my entry and I'll add into it in that spot. And then it will go back down to where my target was. And then I'll have like a good win. I'm not the kind of person where I'm just going to get in with four contracts right away and just see what happens. Like I like to add into it as I become more and more right, because as you're becoming more and more right, that's basically the market saying, Hey, your expected value is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So the more you're right, the more you should add into that trade. But yeah, it's just so difficult to, to really master that. It's just going to take years and years and years of experience, but because every big trader that I know, I mean, they all do that. They all have some video on fucking YouTube where it's like, hey, check it out. This is my 500K day, you know? And then every other video, they're making like two grand a day. And it's like, you know, yeah, those two, are the up people. Up two, down two, up two, down two. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's true though. I think, I think exponential trading, bet size trading is, is probably the hardest part I know this is kind of my current ceiling as well, or my current playground of 
you know, what I'm trying to improve because the, the actual trading part, you know, the strategy and stuff like that isn't necessarily the so hard. And then you kind of manage your emotions and then you kind of figure that out. But then it's like, oh, wait, you know, this is a good setup. I need to 5X my size. And then this is a, and then, you know, when you're dipping your toes, like you want to go tiny size. I think this was a big problem I had in the beginning because I was like, okay, my, you know, average size per trade is let's say $5,000. And I was like, okay, I want to make, you know, my new average $10,000. So every trade, I'm just going to trade with $10,000. And then what happened right away was I would have four trades in a row with $10,000 and they were all red. And I just had like max loss for no reason. I'm like, oh, like sizing is so scary, you know, but in reality, I should have not changed anything except once that good trade comes, then boom, mm -hmm. I smack it with like 30 K mm -hmm. and then that will increase my overall average. Right. Yeah. So but yeah, that's that's such a hard thing to wrap your mind around. At least I know it, it, it was for me, and I'm sure it's going to be for many traders. But that's that's how you do it. There's so many different approaches to it, too. It's like, okay, well, when do you know when to add? Do you wait for your original old tart? Let's say I'm looking for five points. I get in with one contract. I get to five points, and it comes back to my entry. Do I add again looking for that same five points? Or would it have been smart to just sell that one contract trade, wait for it to come back and then get back in with two more, you know, yeah. or like, do you like, what is your max size in relation to your starter size? Right. Are you, yeah. uh, are you going to have 10 contracts and your starters only one, where the hell are you going to find all these places to add nine more contracts? Right. So, yeah. or are you going to start with one and your max size is three, right? You only have to add two more times after your first entry, you know, like it's easy to look at a, like a chart that's already finished and be like, oh, look, this is a front side because we broke out. We used prior resistance as support. Then we broke out again. And then we used prior resistance as support. And we broke out again. I could have gotten long yeah. here. I could have waited two hours and I could have gotten long again on the support that was prior resistance, gotten long again on the support that's prior resistance, sold at the end of the day for 40 points. And I had three contracts, right? But it doesn't work like that. So yeah, I found talking about trades in hindsight is just so easy. Uh, that's why I kind of stopped doing recap videos. I used to do one every day for almost two years or actually over two years. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of thinking like this isn't, for me, it was really helpful. And for, I think a lot of people, part of the community, it was helpful to kind of go from zero to one. But then I hit that point where it's like, you know, a lot of this stuff, you're going to have to go through your own your own battles. And like, for me, my, the way I'm going to do it is going to be totally different than you're going to do it. So for me, here's an example of how it goes. Like I'll, I'll do like a, maybe a few dip my toes in trades, you know, small size. It might be through like 300 shares, like totally will t t mess up my stats. If I, if I care about like that. Um, but then I'll know, man, I have no flow on this ticker. Or sometimes I'll be like, I'm really in the flow on this ticker. I'm nailing these trades. And I just, I'm like predicting how this ticker is going to move. Cause I'm like, okay, it's going to pull back to here and then it's going to break out. And then like, I'll do these things over and over again. And I'll know this is a ticker I'm on the flow on. And then that's when it'll do another one of those setups. And what I was explaining before, you know, the macro and the micros are all lining up. And that's when I just punch it. I'll punch the size really heavy. And if I lose on that trade, I don't even yeah. care. Cause I'm like, you know, most of the time that's going to work. And if I don't size, I'm leaving so much money on the table. So the opportunity cost of taking that loss right now is totally fine. Yep. So that's, that's how I justify it. And that's how I do it myself. Um, and I, I, I wish like I could have told my like younger yeah. self <laughs> and even like a year and a half, two years ago. You know, that's what you need to be doing because I had the biggest sizing issues when I was just like, okay, I'm going to do like every trade $10,000 now, boom, yep. boom, boom, three losers and you're, you're screwed, yeah. you know? So. Yeah. It's so easy to think that you can just like, oh, I'm going to 2X my size now because I have a good month. It's so easy <laughs> to think that. And then the second yeah. you try it, you're like, oh shit. And then three months go by and you're back to your old size and you're like, oh, I'm going to try it again. And then it's like, oh <laughs> shit. And then three months go by and you just do it over and over and over. And then you're, once you get to the point where you've tried to size up like 10 times probably, and you failed, that's probably when it'll start working. But like, yeah, that's, a, that's, yeah. Yeah. It's such a battle. It's ridiculous.
that's what happened to you and I, in a way, I know we both, you know, had multiple sizing uh, attempts and I, we both got slammed down multiple times. So we had to learn the hard way. It would have been nice to kind of know about exponential sizing a little bit more. I know you, you shared a whole section on this pod about it. And I think if anyone wants to learn about exponential sizing, I'll, I don't know if I could link it in this video because we're not at a thousand subs yet, but uh, I'll, maybe I'll link it in the comment below. You, that was a really great breakdown and I'll share the post maybe in the pinned comment. And another thing I would probably recommend anyone to do and you maybe give me your thoughts here is just, you know, read some poker books on expected mm. value because yep. that's that's really where the, the science comes from already. There's so much science behind it. Like if you, you know, on the Annie's, you, if, if you don't have smaller big blind, you typically just fold right away unless you're trying to bluff or something because you don't want to get eaten alive by these antes uh, but the second you have a good hand you need to be sizing up quickly because you want to draw as many people in as possible get that pot size going <laughs> so you can so your winner will be a big winner mm -hmm. and it's worth scaring some people out if that's what it takes yeah that's what's cool so. about poker is it's such a psychological game too where aggression usually wins because you're being aggressive and that is it you know i yeah. wish the same thing was true in the stock market but it's not um, the, the values and the whole idea of poker is just insanely similar to trading. And the cool part about poker is there's 52 cards. The thing that sucks about trading is there's infinite. So your expected value every day, you can see the same setup, identical stock price, identical float, identical volume, identical daily chart. And one will be different than the other still when you trade that yeah. breakout. So Part of me kind of likes that about trading. Like yeah. Uh, there's, yeah, there's infinite variables that you know about and there's infinite variables that you don't know about. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what happens after you click the buy button? Or today yeah. I had a giant wick go like, I don't know, four or 5% below my all my limit orders and it popped right back up and I didn't get filled. It would have been an yeah. instant, really nice trade. And I was like, oh, this is such a, yeah. you know, BS. But it's, it's kind of like surfing, you know, there's like infinite variables like no day will ever be the same. The tide's always going to be a little bit different, the size, yeah. the wind direction. And I guess that keeps it really exciting and addicting. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, and I, I guess poker yeah. is probably somewhat similar because all the characters are, you know, players, but there's more caps, right? 52 mm. cards, eight players, max typically. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's always going to be variants in poker where you have aces and you're going to lose, you know? You have kings, you're gonna lose. You have a whole session where you have like six hands where you have seventy percent equity and you're going to lose, you know. But uh, and that happens in trading too. But the thing that sucks is like trading is such a like if someone beats you in poker, you can at least look at them in the eyes and be like, that is the person that beat me. He outplayed me, right? He's smarter than me. He made the right decisions that I did not make. In trading, you are it's invisible. We don't know who we're fighting against. So you really are fighting against yourself. So whenever I win yeah. or lose, it's like, and I was listening to this, the, uh, yeah. I was listening to the psychologist and he was saying, uh, like our brains are so reptilian still. Like we just, we have this urge to win. Like human beings want to win. No one just goes out to do something to fucking lose, right? Like if you're hunting and you either win or you fucking die, right? Like you starve to death. And those, that's how our brain thinks. And then you go into trading and, you know, I have a strategy where I have a 20% win rate on that strategy. And for one week, I'll take that strategy 30 times and I'll literally win four trades out of those 30. And by the end of the week, I am like, holy shit, trading is fucking impossible. Trading is like, this is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. You know, it's like this super like taxing thing on my emotions and all that. And then I'm like, wait a second, buddy. Like this is called probability and you're experiencing it. Okay. This has nothing to do with you or whatever. Like this is the strategy. It says right there, your win rate is that percentage. So why are you mad whenever that is what happens? Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's so hard to get to the point though, where you're okay with the uncertainty all the time. And you're just okay yeah. with being like, you know what, today I'm going to make a ton of mistakes. I'm going to make a couple of things that aren't mistakes. And I'm going to make sure by the end of the day, I know what I did that was a mistake. And I know what I did that wasn't a mistake. And then I need to go into tomorrow, take one thing out of my playbook from yesterday and add one thing new, you know? <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. For me, the best is to usually limit that market exposure because I've said this a million times. I feel like my focus is only like two hours and that's already a lot, you know, like think about when you're in the lecture. I remember I had this accounting lecture and I actually kind of found the topic interesting at first, like they were going through some really good stuff and I was already doing, I was basically a CFO for our software developing company. And I, I generally enjoyed it, but like, I always noticed around like, you know, an hour and a half, no matter how hard I tried, like, you know, where your eyes just start, they just, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, blurry, blurry. Yeah. And you just, uh, there's a word, like you get glazed over your eyes or something like your focus is just no longer there. You need at least like a 15 minute break, maybe walk around, like eat yeah. something, maybe do like, you know, like forced meditation or something like that. Um, so that's a little bit how my trading goes. Like, I really liked like from 7 to 8 a.m. Eastern, sometimes I'll like nail something. And then from 8 to 9, I often just give back a lot of profit. So what I'll do or what I've been doing in the last couple of months and so on and so forth is just kind of like sometimes I take a nap, you know, and then I come back in 30 minutes for the market open. And that is much better than if I just trade from, you know, 8 to 10 or 7 to 10 through. Yeah. So uh, today, for example, I basically just called it um, around 9.45, 9.50 was my last trade. I could have sat around till just now 12 noon and maybe be trading BDTX, which is just absolutely exploding. It's up to 20% on the day right now. I just had a beautiful front side. But, you know, I, I, I don't think that's even really worth it. I'd rather like constantly be building confidence. If I wanted to make more money, I should have traded more size on the good setups. And I think, you know, I could have easily had a $10,000 a day. And usually when I over trade and just trade longer and longer and longer, I just make more and more mistakes. And then the, the next day I'm even more exhausted. And it's just like this, this snowball effect of frustration. So man, like yesterday, Monday, I was up, I needed to do so many things. And I was like, Mondays are my worst day. Statistically Monday over three plus years, is my least amount of profit. It's like Monday and then it's like Tuesday mm. and then it's Wednesday. Each day is a little bit smaller, but always Monday's the worst. And then it's like this, Tuesdays are the best. So I was like, let me just cash my green, relax, start off the week good. This is what I say I'm always going to do, but I never do it. And I got so much work in on other projects. I just felt great. And then I had an amazing surf day and then I had a phenomenal dinner because I was fasting. So I was like, Mm -hmm. And great dinner. And then Franzi, my girlfriend, she was like, Alex, you had a great day today, didn't you? And I was, <laughs> I was just cheesing, you know, like I had no expectations yesterday. And then I just, I didn't overstay my welcome with anything I did yesterday. You know, it was just like, you know, surfing, but I had my like two hours of amazing waves. And I was just like, you know, I could keep going, but I'm getting a little chilly and like, I'm just going to go back and, you know, have some grub. So like, I don't know, never overstaying your welcome is, is so good. <laughs> yeah, that's there's there's a lot of beauty to that for sure. Like whenever yeah. whenever you feel like you want to go do something else or what you're doing is no longer enjoyable, just go yeah. fucking do it. Like it's not that just hard. Do it. But it's hard yeah. whenever you're down on the day, you know. And then yeah, you're like, that's that's when I I also have a hard time. I'll you be know, down and I'm it, like, I go ahead. No, no, you you go. You go. You go. I was just gonna you say, go. like, I'll be down, and then I'll be like, oh, like my way to to fix what I my problems are is to keep trading and to like figure out a new thing that's wrong. But it's like, no, 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 no. The second you're no. fucked up like that, the only way to learn is to stop trading and to look what you've done already, not create more things in the future. Like that's yeah, it's such an yeah. ass backwards thing, but everyone does it. If it's an expected value negative kind of day, then is sticking around longer today really the best way to get green? Yeah. Maybe you can get back to break even. And usually if I'm around on the day, I want to get back to at least break even. Sure. But uh, it's probably not going to be your biggest green day ever. And you got to keep at least that part in mind. Mm -hmm. And I think that that alone will help. Uh, but what, what I was going to say is like, I've been reading, uh, you know, David Goggins and then the, the book Quit, and then I watched the Arnold documentary, the new one on Netflix, super good. And it's kind of funny because like, ah, oh, like each person, it's this tug and pull, right? Davy Gons is really like basically go until you die kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And then these other two sources, the No One to Quit book, literally it's called Quit at, by Annie Duke. And it's, it's so good because it's like, 
she you know talks about Muhammad Ali where he was at the top but then he fought for another six years and he just got worse and worse and he got basically beat up every fight at one point he should quit a long time ago his doctors were saying to quit and you know he was just falling apart and at the end he had to quit because his medicals were so bad um and then you have somebody like Arnold who is uh, and a lot of people don't know that about Muhammad Ali. Everyone only knows Muhammad Ali from like, you know, his peak, right? Mm-hmm. So then you have someone like Arnold who was like, you know, peak bodybuilder. He was like the 10, 10 years in a, in a row world champion. He won like 23 world titles of like different uh, weight, uh, um, what's it called? Different competitions. Mm-hmm. And then he quit. He was just like, I'm done. Uh, he could have kept doing that for another 20 years, but you know, it just would have got, he, he started would have just faded at one point. And then, you know, he went to the movie career. He was the highest gross grossing actor at one point. And then he was mm-hmm. like, you know what, I'm done. I'm going to go into politics. You know, mm-hmm. it was just like, I really admire that ability to like kind of walk away when it feels so right to keep going. Mm. And, uh, there's a lot to learn about that, but it's tough. Like, when do you do the David Goggins? You know, how do you get to that? You know, he had the highest amount of pull-ups and it was like 3.2 or maybe it was even 4,000 pull-ups. You know, you'll never be that if you just quit, you know, when you're tired. But then, you know, how do you know when to quit when you're at the yeah. at the peak? And it's, I find that topic so interesting. And I, I don't know if there's ever a perfect answer, but I think the more you do something like for me with trading, you have so many red days in a row where you go from like, you know, north of thousand dollars profit to max loss. And you're just like, okay, well, this isn't it. You know, I can't keep David Goggins to this and just go from, you know, great green to max red. Mm-hmm. And so there is, there is a level to leave at, and mm-hmm. you're not going to find it without at least having a lot of attempts to, to find when to walk away. Yeah. That's really cool. It's yeah. It's almost like you want to have a balance between all three of those philosophies, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like Arnold, he was so good at the things that he chose to do like inherently good. He didn't really, I mean, obviously, yes, he worked extremely hard to be a bodybuilder, but like, he's not going to look like that without really good genetics too. Right. And he was strong Uh as a young kid. He had that older brother that uh, was like a weaker than him and they had competition all the time and his family was not nice and all that stuff. And he came to America and he's like, America's fucking like incredible, you know, the best place in the whole world. And then he moved to America. And then, you know, like you said, once he's done, it's like, what do I do now? I don't know. I'll just... I'm like a massive dude that like is probably desirable in some kind of movie role and then does Conan and it's game over, you know? And then it took him five years to get to, to Conan because nobody wanted him. So that, that also would have been tough. Like would he, should he, if he have quit, you know, everyone Mm -hmm. was telling him to quit. So it's, yeah, I don't don't want to cut you off, but man, it's like, when do you know sometimes? Right. And he was able to say no to all the shitty movies because he was already successful, you know? Like he said, that helps. Yeah. Like yeah. he didn't, he didn't care. Right. So it's like he, there, he wasn't in desperation ever after winning all the bodybuilding stuff. Right. I mean, he probably was, but over the, like a decade career of a, the new things he was trying, not really, but then there's Goggins who's like, you know, I think the reason why he is that way is because most of the stuff he does is a physical limitation type thing where it's like, how far can I push my body? And like, yes, you can definitely push your body extremely further than like anyone could imagine and that probably can just keep going until like he's literally just too old his body is just degrading but then trading is something where you can't do that like you will implode like you will blow up like you will lose all your money like i think that for the first couple years maybe it's good to just be like approaching the market every day saying you know I'm going to try to learn something new. I'm going to make sure I stay here until I figure out what I did wrong today, all that kind of stuff. But then once you hit the profitable point, it's way less of that and way more of like, I need to sit back, make sure when I'm trading, I'm only trading the best setups with huge size and I'm avoiding all the bullshit because all the bullshit is bullshit and is going to make me lose money over the course of the year anyway. And I'm only going to make money if I use max size and the great setups. So yeah trading is such a delicate balance between those things where it's like you have to be in the flow state you have to be dedicated or you're totally never going to make it at all you have to have really good work ethic but you also have to be so in tune with yourself that you know when to quit and when to push 
and yeah. it can't be related at all to anything that is your own mind's narrative. It has to be on pure objective facts that are sitting in front of your face. Like I can't, if I'm thinking like, oh, the interest rates are whatever and like the market's going to crash. So like, I'm just going to short every day, you know, I'm going to lose a lot because that's my narrative. And I'm not, I'm not listening. Like the market has a front side uh, and I'm shorting it. Well, who's the idiot? Me. Cause I'm taking my narrative and making it uh, my objective in the market. Whenever the market's telling me clearly, like we're in a front side, you should not be shorting, you know? Yeah. So true. I, uh, I used to, an example of that is I used to really study the news releases of these, these uh, shitty, you know, small cap stocks, which most of them are. And I'd be like, oh, you know, how good is this news? Mm -hmm. And I would create so many biases. And then the ticker goes up 200% and I didn't trade it at all because I'm like, right. no, this, this, this news wasn't good. Who the hell cares what the news is, you know? Like, <laughs> it's up, yep. it's going up, man. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, I, yeah, that's, that's one of those things where it's like, you don't want to create those biases around really anything, you know, it's yep. the, the charts are pretty black and white. It's like, it's going up or it's not. So, yeah. And actually Tim, Tim Sykes, uh, to, to feed to your point, he, uh, he even says like, he's a retired trader or like mm -hmm. he, you know, he tries to pretend he's retired and only if the best setup comes, he'll, he'll actually trade it. Which, you know, for him, he probably takes it too far because he might be have like a quarter million dollar a year when maybe he could have had like a $2 million a year. Um, that's fine. Like, that's not his goal. His goal is really to do his uh, philanthropies and, and grow his subscriber base uh, in terms of, um, you know, his trading uh, program. So I, I get it. It's not really his focus and trading can take up a lot of your time. So there so the the risk reward and the value proposition probably isn't there for him. But I think it's a great philosophy to some extent, you know. Don't don't trade until those good setups come. Because if I did that today a little bit better, I uh, I probably would have avoided some really shitty tickers. Yeah. But yeah, with small caps, you often don't know if it's a good stock until like 15 minutes in. Sometimes you know. <laughs> and then even then, it's like, uh oh. Yeah, and I'm even about then, to buy a know. breakout. Yeah, two dollars. There's resistance too. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. At two dollars, yeah. BDTX. You know, I was yeah. like, oh, this is extended. Now it's at five dollars. No, now it's at six twenty. What the hell? I we yep. literally as we when we started the the conversation, <laughs> it was like at four dollars. Yeah. So yeah, we just went up another fifty percent. So wow. you just it's, you just never know. It's nice though, because like usually you can kind of tell. But you have to be, it's like a competition between amongst amongst all really high level traders. So it's like, okay, here's a ticker. Well, it's up 100%. It's trading 500,000 shares in the pre-market. It's not a sub dollar. It has a float of 20 million. You know, it's an AI company. So it's like, okay, got that. And then you're like, well, the first, the, let's say the first breakout kind of flushes, it loses half of its game, but then it recovers immediately. And let's say you traded that and you got a good win on it. And you're like, wow, that was really strong. And then it breaks out again. And you're like, oh, well, I missed that one. And then it breaks out again. And you're like, oh, shit, I missed that one. And then it breaks out again. And you're finally ready to take it. You take the breakout, flushes on you. That almost is probably a byproduct of the fact that the best traders are literally fighting to get the max size on the earliest opportunities because the second leg is way better than the first leg usually, right? And then if yeah. you have a third leg, that's like not going to be as good as the second. And then every leg that goes on after that, your expected value is getting less and less and less, unless you're trading like, you know, the S&P 500 on like a yearly time frame, right? But on a small cap, every single time that those you have a new leg, it's getting less and less likely to continue. Obviously there are those like rare examples where, you know, 10 it goes times exponential year, and yeah, it goes from five to 200 or whatever, but yeah. 90, 95% of the time it's going to be the other way. So it's kind of funny to think like, maybe that is because the big traders already took that first trade and they were like, that was a really good momentum after losing half of its gains. I'm going to get the next one right away with bigger size. And they go, boom, next one, they got it. That's the second leg. Third one, they'll take it again with big size. Fourth one, maybe they take it with size and then stop out for break even. And then they're like, well, that one was the first one that was not good today. I'm quitting. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man, it's so tough. I, I'll, I'll tell you what, like 
so like sometimes I'll, I'll get too excited. I'll be like, Oh yeah, I just had a green trade. And then I'll look and I'll, I'll sit back too much. But like, yep. sometimes that's exactly when I need to like really punch it for the next 15 minutes. Because if I don't exactly what you said, it happens where it, it like keeps going up. And then I'm like, ah, no, I already had my green trade. And then it goes up again. And I'm like, mm-hmm. ah, do I really want to? And then I finally, you know, go for that next one. And then I get flushed on. So, you know, once you notice a ticker working like BDTX, like I did not, I did not uh, light up on it because it had like almost 1 million shares being traded pre-market. That's absolutely insane. Like it's yeah, pre, it's odd. pre-market was almost as good as it's, it's market open, which is not ever almost the case. It's usually like a five X difference in volume. So like this, this ticker was pumping and I was like, oh man, this is not the time to celebrate after your first victory. Like I got to keep mm-hmm. going. Yeah. Oh. It's hard because when you get that win, especially if you're in a lack of confidence state, you know, like let's say you had a bad week last week, you get one win and you're like, nice. I then you then you're Ooh. like, shit. Well, I only made back like my Thursday and Friday losses. And then you're yeah. like, not then you're already not thinking of the, the ticker anymore. And then the ticker just broke out another 20%. And you're like, fuck, like that was the trade that I should have had size in because I won on the first one. And and then the next day comes around and you're like, okay, well, I missed yesterday. I'm ready today. Take the yeah. first trade, you win. Second trade, you size up, flush. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Or or you're doing something else. Like sometimes I'll be editing a video or working on some code or something. Yeah. And I see it, it move a ticker and then I take that trade and I'm like, okay, well, I'll wait for that next setup. I'll get busy again. And then I'm missing the move. So I kind of have this rule where... If, if I, I can allow myself to do other projects when I'm trading, cause sometimes nothing happens for two hours and I'll mm. actually cause more damage. Cause then I start, you know, it's like being in the desert. You just start seeing things that aren't there. Yeah. So it actually helps me to distract my brain a little bit. And then I'll have my second screen, which is with like, I don't know, the top five tickers that day. And if something starts moving, like, I don't know, ticker breaks over VWAP and it's back in play, then I'm like, I'm no longer to allowed to kind of play with all these other things that I need to do. I need to be dialed in on trading and I can only go back to the other things once this ticker is no longer in play. Basically, uh, I don't know, now the five minute is below, uh, you know, the former five minutes below VWAP or whatever you have, have you. So, um, because I, I cannot do two things at once. Like yeah. I cannot switch back and forth at all. Nobody can. At, it's, it's like a yeah. fallacy, you know? <laughs> yeah, multitasking is, is a lie. Yeah. Actually, I love David Goggins because he always, he talks so much shit about multitasking. Like uh, he's really a diehard, do one thing at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, which I think uh, in today's world, we need to th- do more of that because... There's so many distractions around us all the time, especially as a trader. You know, we have so many screens. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I used to, you know, stream while I was trading, which I felt like was a, uh, it was a great time, but man, it was, it was very distracting. Mm-hmm. Um, and oftentimes I wouldn't even trade on my stream because I just made a lot of money pre-market and now the stream started and I was so busy in the chat room and I would miss a move. And then I would kind of start being like, oh, okay, well, I already am up or someone, I don't know. I just mm-hmm. like, it was so hard for me to get in any flow state on the stream. So, you know, hats off to people that do that. Um, but I don't, I don't know if it's the best thing. Plus it creates a lot of copy trading environment. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's tough. I think there's a lot of pros, but there's a lot of cons too yeah. for, for both parties. I um, think if for me, like I'm not going to stream until I'm making like 250, 250K a year and I have something to sell to people because... Once it gets to that point, then it's like, you know, I've paid my fucking dues. You're not getting shit for free anymore. And uh, if you want to see what I'm doing, like, sure, you can do that. But if you want to, like, learn what I'm doing, there's a course that you can pay me for yeah. or whatever, you know. And obviously, right. I think that is probably, I mean, it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that every fucking big trader we know does that, you know. I think that's like the path of a, that's like the evolution of a trader. Really. You do it for, let's say you hit your peak career in 10, in 10 years. And then once you're at that peak, like most traders are going to be the the type of people that are like, well, I had enough. Like I did it. I'm, I don't need to make $25 million a year. Like my life. Cause at, let's say you're at the 10 year mark and you're making like 2 million a year. Like you've already had enough years where you've made a million or whatever. It's not going to feel like anything anymore. Like 
you know, you kind of wanted to go do something else and the way to, you know, usually whenever you master a skill, what can you do that could teach it to someone else? So, yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely agree though. Like making a course or something is, is probably uh, the right approach because once you dedicated so much time into something, it kind of feels weird just to leave it. Yeah. If you, if you sure. haven't put like a nice period at the end of the sentence or something mm -hmm. like that, and usually packaging everything, you know, into like a course or something, even if you don't need the money, it does, it does create like a nice, you know, this is my achievement. Here you mm -hmm. go. You know, uh, maybe yeah. the markets have changed a little bit, but ultimately you can learn everything in this course. So That's it is, it is nice to invest in that. I mean, there's, there's like, there's things that you like, I don't know, you're a race car driver, you're a pro athlete, you're a, a scientist, like you, you will study a domain for so long, but what are you going to leave people when you're gone? You know, you have to, uh, you want to leave, you want to improve the human race to some extent. You want to, you want to make sure that people don't from start from zero. You know, there are always going to, the next generation is able to get further than you. Um, so I think that's why what drives a lot of people to create these products, like good people, like there's a lot mm -hmm. of scam products that are yeah, out yeah. for money, but then like professionals, like real people that care about something will mm -hmm. create this. So the next people can take it even further because they're not starting from zero. I think yeah. that's why a, a lot of people do create stuff like a master class or something. Yeah. I think, yeah, there's obviously good ways and bad ways to teach people things. Like, I think the bad way is probably, you know, make like a, like a Tim Sykes style thing where you have, you know, 20 hours of DVDs that you have to watch that were made like eight years ago or whatever. Yeah. It's, I'm sure he has the newer stuff too, but that's probably not the direction to go. Like, I think it'd be way more fun to be like, I have a like prop firm where, you know, you can pay me and we'll sit together for a week and I'll have like a, a meetup, whatever, some city and a, like 20 people show up at, every day for like three days. And I, we trade together in person and, you know, it's all like live teaching. Like there's not, there could be a course where you're like, you know, here's like an hour of like a really fast explanation of what my strategy is, but this is not going to fucking teach you anything. You need to be watching what I'm doing at your day. We need to be talking every day, making sure you're not FOMOing, you know, fear, greed, whatever, yeah. stubbornness, all that stuff. But, uh, and the cool thing too about trading is like, once you get to that level, which I'm not, I have, I'm literally like a decade away from that level, but like, I can already tell that wow. like our, the, my direction in terms of my understanding of my own strengths and weaknesses is just so fucking cool. Like every day, whenever I yeah. sit back and I'm like, wow. I'm a stubborn fucking person. And I never saw myself as stubborn until I started trading because like for me to short something 10 times in a row and to lose 10 times in a row in one day on a front side, that is be, that's called being stubborn. Right. But the good thing is like, you know, whenever we're in a backside, I'll short, I'll hold it, I'll add into it and I'll get a really big trade. And then it's like, okay, well, <laughs> what is your biggest strength? Well, the answer is your biggest strength is the same thing as your biggest weakness, right? Like usually you're not going to have your biggest strength, not be also your biggest weakness. So it's like, mm. you know, like I can be stubborn and I'll short the front side, but whenever it's on a backside, I'll also be stubborn and I'll be adding into my trades and trying to get a big winner and I'll get that big winner. So it's like my, you know, and yeah, like that. extrapolate that forever where it's like, you're constantly going to be learning these things about yourself that you don't even realize are there because your stats and your performance is so terrible or very good, you know? Yeah. It's such a self-discovery yeah, thing. It's ridiculous. That's the best part about trading. Um, you know, once, once you get past the profitability mark and like you, cash flows and stuff, I feel like to me, the reason like I really like trading at this point of my, my journey is, I've learned so much about myself that I don't know if I would have learned with anything else. I mean, I guess being a pro at anything, you're going to kind of learn these things because yeah, you're, you're just, you're going to have to deal with a lot of uh, walls and mm -hmm. those moments trading definitely is like a daily iteration of those. Yep. And you just kind of, you got to ask yourself a lot of hard questions as a trader for sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. 
Dang, I really uh, wish Toby. I wish Toby was here because he'd be able to definitely give really good insight on that. Because he obviously was an Olympic skier. Olympic, yeah. So it's like, and when I see him trade, I'm like, wow, this dude is fucking firing it off. Like he, he is very confident in himself and ready to go whenever the signs are there. And I was like, that's an awesome strength, but it's definitely going to be his biggest weakness too, you know. And yeah, I, wonder, I mean, for sure, yeah, because he'll have those big red days and stuff, but uh. It's going to pay off at one point. Oh, for sure. But I would love to hear what he would say about that thing. Yeah, we should definitely ask him maybe next week. I think next mm-hmm. week we'll probably have a full house. Yep. I think Danny will be back from Italy. Uh, I'll have to talk to Toby to see what he's doing. And I'm pretty sure Tom's going to jump on. So that'd be really fun. So, uh, man, there's always so much to talk about and think about. I, I just saw ICIU. A- a- C- I- blow up just went from 240 to three dollars bdtx is Holy pulling hell. back a bit but could be good oh man and then you know all these interesting conversations hmm. like but yeah I, I guess just to wrap up that point is i was doing business probably from like 16 well to now obviously but i was always doing like these little businesses with my brother and I never got to this point of self-exploration as I did with trading. Mm. So, yeah, I think you do have to be a pro at something because I think being a business owner, there's just too much like a lag between Mm. things. Like, yeah, we'll have tough days and stuff, but it's not this like a thousand things just get smacked in your face in such a short period of time. And you're just like... Like if I, like I've lost so much money in businesses and I've had some big successes. Actually, my brother just sent me a PL statement of like 2015 and we were crushing it. I was like, holy <laughs> shit, we made that much money in 2015. And we were just kind of like <laughs> laughing about it. And I never once was like, you know, where I would walk in or on a big red day in business. I don't know. We lost, you know, $20,000 or got scammed or something. I would never walk into the living room and just be like, you know, lay on the floor and contemplate life because, (laughs) you know, and and I feel like as a trader, you do that often where you're just like, Mm -hmm. oh my God, you know? So like you, you, you get confronted with these questions a lot. Yeah. Um, Cause it's, it's you and yourself. Like you have no one to blame ever except yourself. Like when I got hacked in the last $27,000, I was pissed. I was like screaming like F you in the, in the hotel room for like a good hour. (laughs) I think I probably scared everyone, (laughs) but you know, I was pissed. I was pissed at somebody else. And I was also mad at myself for like, maybe not being more secure, but you know, with businesses, there's, there's, I feel like there's so much else you can blame at one point, but Mm -hmm. with trading, it's like just, you yep um it's crazy it's yeah, so hard so to wanna, accept that like fate I'm... too though yeah like, how do you accept is. that it's your fault you know because you can kind of look back and be like fuck like my friend sent me this trend line right and i'm that i traded off of that trend line or you know i it was watched my broker this video. or whatever yeah, yeah. Well, well those are the worst ones those are like obviously not your those you actually can blame yeah like last monday when stuff. my internet died or or something like okay yeah. there are there are moments where you can probably blame something else um, whenever fucking some ai account t- tweets out some fake picture of the pentagon exploding and i go short and it was fucking fake <laughs> i can blame them okay but yeah, uh when yeah, i'm shorting the front those... side 10 times in a row yeah um, there's only one uh one culprit there Oh my God. Do you want to share anything about your Airbnb business before you wrap up? Uh, anything you want to tell the world? Um, feel free. I don't want to put any pressure on you, but uh, feel free to well promote it or something. I'll just kind of give like a little backstory. I don't really care to promote because I've been doing marketing on Facebook and stuff. And the only people that book the thing are through Airbnb anyway. So I'm like... I guess the site is just good enough on its own. I'm still going to post it's pictures good, and stuff yeah. like it, that, but it's insane. My whole idea behind uh, the Airbnb is literally only because of trading. So, and something else too, but so my family lives on like this 70 acre land in Pennsylvania and we uh, have like so much landscaping and just shit to do all the time. And I was like talking to my mom and dad probably two years ago. And I was like, how do we get, cause my parents, like I would always have to do the landscaping and they didn't pay me. And, uh, 
it's just so much fucking work. And my dad would have to do a bunch of shit. My mom would have to do a bunch of shit. And I'm just like, how do we like my, my aunt? Okay. Let me just back it up a little even further. My grandma has like a 300 acre land. And whenever everyone moved out of it, now we go back to that land and it's like a jungle, like overgrown. And it's just crazy. And I love my home so much. Yeah. So I want to make sure that there's like a way for the property to make money as like an entity itself, you know, because the property is so cool. We have like this awesome pond and all this stuff. But so I was like, how do I figure out a way for the property to make money on its own? Because this is such a great asset. I don't need to go make money doing other shit whenever this is sitting right in front of me. So I built this little cabin for like 10 grand and I was like going to have no internet no shower. It was just going to be like a campsite by our pond to just proof of concept type thing. And then um, as it got deeper, I was like, well, I could add a shower for 500 bucks. I could add the internet for like pretty much free. So I did those two things and then I put it on Airbnb and it's been doing like June was like $500 of bookings. So like in June alone, which is pretty good for like the first month of me even listing it, you know, like Every weekend I was booked. Um, and then it looks good. Get for some the, reviews going. Yeah, we have good reviews and everything. And it's kind of, it's fun, but it's also sad because it's like, I've been trading for three years. I have no money to show for it at all, right? I've only been digging holes. And then, and trading is something that I am not, no one's inherently good at, right? Like you got to really practice and try really hard to be good at trading. Whereas there's things in life where you actually are kind of just good at, good at it because you've done it and that's just like something you're talented at and i like building shit like i built this whole apartment and i just like building stuff i don't know why it was just like something i like to do when i was a little kid i used to build tree houses in the woods all the time and just do shit like that so it's funny that i did something that i was naturally good at like building this little cabin and then like pretty much everyone that has seen it has said to me that you know they like it or whatever there there's no like people saying oh this is ugly but um and all the reviews are good. So it's just kind of like, damn, I wish I would have done something like this way earlier. So I could just have like 10 of them, you know, because once I have like 10 of these little cabins, then I'd actually make legit money from it. But um, yeah, I mean, it it came from I want to I want the property to make money and then it transformed into, well, I need to make money too to take some pressure off of trading because if I don't make money from trading and my goal every day is shit. I need to pay my monthly expenses. I'm going to lose every single day whenever I trade and I'm not gonna be able to make any decisions that are objectively based yeah. off of the price action in front of me. It's going to be based off of what I need out of life. And if you go into the market needing anything, it will take it all from you. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So I'm happy about it. It's, it's cool. Still just uh, like I a am. proof of concept thing, but uh, yeah. Hopefully I can explain. I'm, I'm happy you're, you're doing that and it's working. It's, it's a beautiful. And I think, th- I think that's just great. And I, I saw you on a, a podcast or something. I have yet to watch it. I put it on watch later. Cause I, uh, I think I was at the beach or something when it popped up on my YouTube and uh, notifications. Yeah. Uh, what, what yeah. was that about? Uh, I can't so, wait to check it out. So two years ago, so me and my, my family is like super close. Like we're really close. So Two years ago, I was um, sitting around and I was like, you know, what would be really cool is if so when I have kids one day, I what if my kids could see me talking to my mom when I was 20? Mm-hmm. Right. So like imagine you could see your mom talk to your grandma whenever your mom was like 20 years old. You know what I mean? Like that That's would be really mom. I know it'd be a trippy. It's like a trippy thought. And I'm like well, I should just start a a podcast with my mom. Like I'll just make a podcast with my mom. So I spent like $30 and got like these little shitty, like clip on mics and me and my mom made like two episodes. And then we just stopped because we just, the equipment was so shitty and it was just annoying as hell to, to set everything up and it was just whatever. And then that was like the inception of the idea of let's preserve memories right because that's kind of the whole goal of podcasting for me with a like not the trading podcast i guess it could be the same thing but with my family and like interviewing my family and people i love and stuff like that i want to make sure that i have these memories preserved in some kind of capsule you know and like youtube is that thing so me and cooper cooper's my little brother he's how old is he 20 he's like almost 21 this year he'll be 21 and he's the youngest out of us four. So I have an older sister. She's 
like 29 now. I'm 26. My little brother's 20 and my sister's like 23 or something like that. So yeah, we've like quite the family, huh? Yeah, it's 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 great. But um me and Cooper, we started a podcast like I think it was like six, six or eight months ago. And we just had like shitty mics too. And uh we were like just it was just me and him talking really. And then we were like, we should just get like really good equipment and like just make it more fun because the thing that sucks about podcasting is like the thing that's nice about podcasting if you're on zoom is you just like click a button on your computer and you're good to go for a, like a home podcast and you have to set it all up like it just sucks because you takes like an hour to set everything up then you got to take your computer like i gotta move all my computers and do all this shit and so i was like let's just build a studio inside of our house and like i'll build the table like he uh, got like the curtains and we got these nice mics and just all this shit. And we're like, let's just do it for real. And every Sunday we'll, we'll interview somebody. If no one's available to interview, we'll interview each other and we'll just like preserve a bunch of memories. So that was the whole, that's the whole idea behind that. Yeah. All right. Now I know that's good. <laughs> got the, got the insider tips on the podcast. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I'll definitely check it out. I could link it uh, maybe in the comments or in the description of this video. Yeah. So yeah, I we only interviewed curious. like my uh, my mom and dad, and then we interviewed one of our really close friends. That's like a crazy like army dude, but uh, yeah. I feel like I got a tons more questions, but we'll probably have to call it, <laughs> otherwise it's going to go too long. Unless there was something else you wanted to quickly share. No, no, I like doing a bunch of random shit with my life. It's fun. Yeah, it keep uh, keeps it exciting. Keep the serendipity. <laughs> hi exactly high serendipity. Serendipity. yeah yeah oh yeah i still got to make a video about that but that's a yeah, different topic <laughs> <laughs> well i guess we'll call it there cool. it was really nice and a good one-on-one -on -one, actually we haven't yep. had that since new york <laughs> i know right i was like dang finally <laughs> yeah so it's uh it's easy to just keep to keep talking but we'll we'll wrap up the pod so it doesn't go too long and uh yeah anything else are you still in Portugal? Yeah, I'm here till Friday, but I, I kind of want to cancel the flight because Friday we have the biggest waves coming in. Dang. And whoo, dude, today, oh my God, I forgot what it's like to surf like seven plus foot waves. Like, oh man, it, there was some that I don't know if, do you, have you ever surfed before? I only, only one time. Okay. Well, there's there were like three foot waves, know. but. <laughs> oh, fair enough. I mean, you probably still like intense experiences, but there's this one point where like if a wave breaks like right in front of you, you're going to have a really hard time to duck dive it. And I had, there's this monster wave and I was like, <laughs> shit. And I, I'm pretty good at duck diving. I'm surfing my whole life. And I just, I went so deep and it still just ripped me off my board. Dang. And I was just underwater like, ah! oh my and God. then like, but you know, it's, it was scary today a little bit because it's been a while since I surfed big waves. Uh, this is big to me, like seven foot. Some people are like, that's nothing. But I, I was, I was like, and then, you know, like you, you paddle and then there's just like this, this cliff and you're just like, shit, I just got to stand up and go. Once you're standing and you just like go down the face, it's fine. Mm -hmm. But whoo, like, dude, yeah, when, when those outsiders take a picture or something. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of people actually taking pictures on the beach uh, with like huge cameras, but mm. um, I don't know when, when those outsiders come in, which are basically like extra big waves like every now and then like 10 minutes, there's like really big sets, you know, which mm. are like an extra 30% bigger or something. And yeah. you just kind of feel like you're in a war zone. You're like, Oh shit. Like, let's go, <laughs> you know, cause th those things will hold you under for a bit. Uh, cause mm. it was a little choppy today, but yeah, I don't know, that's what I've been up to. Uh, so that's awesome. another reason Dude, you got to cancel up. that flight. Yeah, yeah, we have we have a birthday. Uh, friends having a birthday in uh, in Paris, so mm -hmm. we said we're gonna fly in for it. Um, yeah, <laughs> shit. Is that that same? <laughs> but, is that the girl that we talked about in New York? It's in yeah, that ran yeah, out like a thirty room like. Yeah, type that's thing? her. Yeah. Yep. So uh, I guess I don't want to miss that, but um, yeah, that would be fun yeah. too. Damn, but, that's a hard uh, choice. Yeah, a lot of cho tough choices right now, you know, like I, c I could be trading BDDTX right now. Oh man, <laughs> it's going. I got to get Is out of here, up? man. Just, oh my God. It's back up. New high of day. Oh wow. There we go. Holy shit. Yeah. So, oh wow. 
dang if we would have just bought at the beginning of the podcast yeah that's the right you know just (laughs) trend following right here at at vwap when it didn't break uh with any volume we just bought it and just smoked a joint and then we'd be up 80 percent right now yeah coulda shoulda woulda trading in hindsight you know this is why i don't do it anymore because it's like it's pointless to talk about almost uh it really is yeah (laughs) all right man cool then have fun brother yeah you too enjoy the rest of your day you still yeah. got the full one ahead of you yeah <laughs> all right man cool till next Later, time bro see ya ciao ciao